Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Wealth with John and Michael Preece of Copper Beach Financial Group. The gentlemen have brought on a guest again. Actually, it's two podcasts in a row, and that's Andy Sheckman. If you have not heard that first podcast that Andy was on, holy cow. Uh, It was amazing. It was such a ton of great information. Uh, And a lot of the information is things that you need to listen to, you need to hear, and you need to look up for yourself. Andy said that multiple times during the podcast. Hey, this isn't just me. Google this. And I did. And wow, uh, it was it was quite impressive. Michael, you brought Andy back on the show this week. Why'd you bring him back? Well, uh, thank you, Eric and Andy. Thanks so much for being back on with us. And uh, we 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 brought Andy back because we probably made the mistake of only scheduling one podcast with Andy <laughs> from the beginning. We probably should have <laughs> automatically had it for two because a lot of, as you said, Eric, a lot of the information that Andy you you talked about last time was just. It was so informative and really interesting that we wanted to have you back on to maybe have a, a follow up and maybe just talk about some other things or opportunities that listeners might be able to take advantage of as it relates to some of that information. So that's really why we had you back on. So thank you so much for uh, being a part of the podcast again. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's, it's certainly my pleasure to to pick up where we left off. Yeah, and this is John, and, and again, welcome back, and uh, thanks, Eric, for uh, being the leader of the pack. Andy, I, I, I had spoken to some clients last couple of weeks and told them about your podcast, they're gonna listen to it. But they all they all had the same reaction from the presentation you made at our family office conference in, in, in Phoenix a month or so ago. They said, you know, we, we read a lot about Andy, we looked into the gold and silver, issues that he talked about, and they had the same questions. What do I do from here? John, what should I implement? Is there a strategy that you typically recommend clients to consider? Would Andy have some input on that? So that's that's how this all kind of wrapped up for the second podcast. So if you could just start with maybe a little bit uh, on the on the silver market currently today, a little bit where where it's kind of going and where people are positioning themselves. And let's just have a conversation about what folks can do. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> silver to me, John, is in many respects, I think, the most undervalued on the planet. And I would argue that it is amongst the finest investment choices uh, of a generation even. And I don't say that flippantly uh, or trying to put on my sales Manhattan. I mean, let's look at it objectively. First and foremost, let's talk about the demand of silver. Very few assets, and in particular commodities, have duality in demand. In fact, I really can't think of too many, maybe platinum to a little degree. But when you talk about duality in demand, you think of something like copper, which is an industrial metal and an industrial demanded uh, commodity. Uh, You think of something like gold, it's primarily a monetary commodity. Uh, Not much in the way of industrial, although it has some, but not much. It's known for its monetary properties and qualities. When you look at silver, you see an asset that is massively demanded in industry. And especially when, you know, this morning watching the news, I see that GM in the next 10 years is going to be 100% electric. Goodbye to the combustion engine. Uh, The need for silver in a digital and green world uh, is extraordinary. Uh, Anything that conducts electricity by and large uses silver, but in particular in green applications like uh, solar panels, uh, water purification, things like this use copious amounts of silver. Anything in a digital world, Apple iPhones and iPads and computers and tablets all use silver. Uh, the industrial component of silver, in fact, there's 500, nearly almost exactly 500 ounces of silver in the tip of every Tomahawk cruise missile that uh, the military seems to fire off at will. 
And so the need for silver is extraordinary in industrial capacity and growing into uh, places that a lot of the market really hasn't even factored into the equation yet because these are all such new and expanding uh, applications in a world that's moving green. Um, at the same time, we've seen a, a really a renaissance, uh, you guys, in monetary demand. And so you have this dual demand where I think ultimately uh, you will see before it's all said and done, the industrials battling with the hedge funds to take possession, maybe going directly to the producers. But so we we look at a, a, an asset that has great demand, both industrial and uh, digital. We can add to the digital demand, the Chinese Belt Road and Rail Initiative and the industrial demand. This is the largest infrastructure project in human history. Uh, and it is China's attempt to uh, industrialize and connect Asia and Africa. And it's not just by railways and bridges and maritime channels and roads. Uh, it's also digitally. You're connecting 75% of human population digitally. Um, and I think in terms of building out an infrastructure uh, and connecting literally 75% of human population, 45% of globalized GDP before it's globalized of GDP, uh, the need for silver is extraordinary. But let's talk about the supply side. Uh, over the last two years, the industry globally has mined about 800 million ounces. Uh, but the demand has been, in essence, greater than 1 billion ounces per year. We are between four and 500 million ounces in deficit, in shortfall between supply and demand over the last two years. Silver is found in nature in a form called epithermal. Epithermal means it's found very close to the surface. And so what that means is that the big deposits were found years or even decades ago, long before the advent of advanced machinery. And so when we talk about who's pulling the metal out of the ground, it's very fascinating when you hear this. Of the 800 million ounces that were pulled out of the ground, only 30% of it comes from primary silver mining corporations, companies that specifically mine silver. That's it, 30%. Uh, and so when you talk 800 million, that's 240 million of the 800 million come from companies like First Majestic Silver. Keith Neumeyer is the CEO of this company. He's my friend. He shared a lot of this with me. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to hit what he told me in a moment that will really open your eyes to just how scarce it really is, what an opportunity it is. But in any case, so 240 of the 800 million come from primary silver miners. So where does the 70% come from? That comes from byproduct mining of other metals, gold, copper, lead, zinc, whatever. Oh, look, we stumbled across some silver. So 540 of the 800 million come from companies that don't even mine silver. They just stumble across it. They don't have an incentive to go looking for silver the way the primary mining companies do. But because it's found in, in nature so close to the surface, if you've ever gone to a, a silver mine, you can almost see it on the top of the ground sometimes, kick a, kick a stone and you'll see something shine. It's that close to the surface. And so what you have is a depleting asset, an asset that is depleting in nature, that is only mined, 30% of the supply is only mined from primary companies, 70 from byproduct, an asset that is expanding tremendously in demand, not just industrial, but massively in monetary. My company had a record year last year. Um, and... 90% of all of the sales that we did, actually closer to 95, were silver. This year, we've done more business to date than we did last year, and it's at least 90, 95% in silver. So at the beginning of this year in December, I did an interview with Keith Neumeyer on our YouTube channel. And I said to Keith, at the time, the ratio between gold to silver was 85 to one, uh, or 80 to one in that neighborhood. And what I mean by the ratio, you take the price of gold and divide it by the price of silver. So if you go back thousands of years, uh, literally 5,000 years, and looked at the ratio between gold and silver, it was a consistent 
16 to 1. The geologic footprint they call the God's ratio was 15.5 to 1 for thousands of years, meaning you dig a big hole 5,000 years ago, and out of it you pull 15.5 ounces of silver for every one ounce of gold. When Isaac Newton was figuring out currencies, the relationship between gold and silver was 16 to 1. A lot of it had to do with the geologic footprint of the two. And so before I tell you what Keith said, in 2010, I noticed the ratio of gold to silver was 85 to 1. And I looked at a chart, and it was basically the second or third time in human history that it had ever gotten that high. And I begged all of my listeners, I started doing podcasts, and you can find it if you go back and see some of my older podcasts, where I said, listen, trade your gold to silver right now. This is a massive opportunity because this is four feet of snow in the Florida Keys in July, this ratio. It's only happened twice in 5,000 years. And so the idea was to trade your gold for 85 ounces of silver, one ounce for 85. Within seven months, uh, mid-2011, we had $50 silver and $1,915 gold. That's 37 to 1. So anyone who would have traded at 85 to 1 could have traded back at 37 to 1 over doubling, almost tripling what they traded out and now back into. Uh, and so fast forward to December of this year, I see a ratio of 85 to 1. Mind you, in March of 2020, uh, it had reached 125 to 1, the greatest disparity in human history ever. And I begged everyone, trade your gold to silver now. Get into silver now. Ratios are like batting averages. If your favorite baseball player starts the month of April batting 900, you can make any bet to anyone on the planet that they will be closer to 300 than they will be to 900 at the end of the season, and you'll win. The law of averages says that. There's been one baseball player throughout all of Major League history, Ted Williams, who finished the season batting 400. No one else has even come close to that. And so when you talk about regression to the mean or law of averages, they're there for a reason. So in any case, uh, in March, it was 125. By December, it had regressed to 85 to 1. And that's still way, way out of whack. So I asked Keith Newmeyer, I said, Keith, on an interview, which you can find on the Miles Franklin YouTube channel, I said, Keith, what do you think about this 85 to 1 gold to silver ratio that everybody's talking about? He said, Andy, I don't even think about it. Oh, really, Keith? That, that kind of surprises me. He says, well, I think about it in a different way. He said, I, I think about it in terms of the mining ratio. Globally, the mining ratio is seven to one, where for every ounce of gold that is being pulled out of the ground, only seven ounces of silver is being pulled out simultaneously. So what that basically gets at is that, as I mentioned, it's found in a form called epithermal very close to the surface. The big deposits were found decades ago. There's only 30% of all the silver coming to, to market comes from primary miners. Uh, and so if only seven ounces is coming out of the ground for every one ounce of gold, that means this is an asset that is depleting copiously in nature. In fact, the U.S. government came out a few years ago. They have a branch of their government that deals with geologic issues. And they said they believed that silver would be the first element ever struck in from the periodic table of elements. As far-fetched as that sounds, uh, we have a situation now where you have a 75 to one ratio, it's regressed even more to 75 to one, yet it's coming out of the ground at seven to one. And if you were to Google gold silver ratio last hundred years, a chart will come up. It'll be one of the first things you see. And you'll see that it's averaged approximately 42 to one for the last 100, 150 years, uh, even though it's coming out of the ground much lower than that. But even if it just gets to 42 to 1, it's almost a double. If it gets to where it was in 2011 at 37 to 1, it is a double. If it finds its natural relationship between it and gold, it's 10 times undervalued in relation to what's coming out of the ground. So when I put it all together, I see an asset class that is massively needed. There is no substitute for the way it conducts heat and electricity. There are very few things on the planet that will rival the conductivity principles of silver, and that's why it is so massively needed in a form that's basically called inelastic. 
meaning you only need a hundredth of an ounce for an iPhone. You don't care what the cost is. If you're Apple, you buy it. If you only need one ounce or two ounces for a Tesla battery, you buy it. But because it is so copiously needed uh, and becoming scarcer and scarcer and scarcer, and there is a monetary re uh, renaissance where literally hundreds of millions of dollars in, uh, that we do every year is in silver and growing, we're just one company. When you see 300 million ounces taken off of Comex last year by sovereign wealth funds and family offices, that's 10 years worth of deliveries. To me, silver is an incredibly intriguing investment because think of every other asset class right now where you know they're, they're high compared to where they've historically been. Yet silver, with all of these things going for it, massively demanded, diminishing in nature, completely undervalued in its relationship to gold and look at its price. It's half of what it was in 1980. What other, and that's exactly what I'm hearing from, from, from clients that I talk to. They go, well, why is it so cheap? If it's got that kind of, uh, opportunity in the markets as an investment, why are, why are people not buying it at these levels that they, they, they are, but the, our clients are not reading about it. And I guess getting back to the simple question I would pose to you, average people might be listening to this portfolio saying, okay, I have not a lot of money to invest um, as a family. Where's the best opportunity uh, for my family? And I want to do something how how do I how do I look at silver as an investment? I, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but do, how do I buy it? How, how do I look at it as a part of my asset allocation? Is it something I should have in my portfolio for the next 20, 30 years? Is it something I should do on a timing standpoint? Do I try to buy it low and sell high? These are the questions I'm getting from the from the some of the clients I talked to. What, what would your answer be to some of those questions? Well, yeah, I think you always try to buy low and sell high. Rick Rule is a good friend of mine. He's a legendary like, yeah, investor. A yeah. and, and he all, he'll tell you the biggest money he's ever made is buying assets when they are out of favor. Uh, buying low and selling high is difficult to do, but it's really something we're taught as young children and the key to getting ahead and in investing. I look at gold and silver less as an investment and more as wealth. I mean, it's it's... It's an asset class that's lived through two world wars and German hyperinflation and the Great Depression and every pandemic, and it's still immutable wealth. You know, when you see a company like J.P. Morgan admit guilt to the Justice Department and pay a $920 million fine last year for suppressing the price of silver, and at the same time, uh, they have been allowed to keep 1.2 billion ounces of silver that they have acquired. That's, that's uh, 12 times what the Hunt brothers tried to buy in 1980. It's the largest physical position of silver the world has ever seen. And when you see the sovereign wealth funds and family offices drain 10 years worth of silver off of Comex last year, the way that they are doing it, Standard Charter Bank right now in, in, uh, in the UK has been buying up all the thousand ounce bars from the refineries. Uh, Turkey just bought um, a record amount of silver. India is buying record amount of silver. The countries are buying it and they are using the levered futures paper price to do so, to run cover, to keep the price down while they acquire the physical. And if you have that kind of money that these commercial banks and, and, uh, and central banks do uh, and realize the leverage that is found within futures contracts, they have the ability to create a narrative, a reality that don't look here, look at the equity markets that are going crazy and the bond market that's going crazy and cryptos. But at the same time, their actions are betraying their rhetoric. They are gobbling up copious, massive amounts of it while holding down the paper price. And, you know, like I said, a $920 million fine and admitting guilt is, is part and parcel to that equation. Um, and so, yes, I think it should be part of everyone's portfolio. I, um, my business was founded on Swiss investments, and I spent three summers in Zurich in 1989, 90, and 91 learning from Swiss bankers. And uh, we did an awful lot with Swiss investments over the last 30 years, but there's never been a Swiss banker that I have ever met that wouldn't tell me in the very best of times, 10% of your investable assets need to be in metals um, because it's a hedge. 
there is a group out of Chicago called Ibbotson, I-B-B-O-T-S-O-N. They were bought by Morningstar, the mutual fund rating agency. And Ibbotson came out and said, because interest rates have been held down so low that traditional forms of investing, stocks and bonds, have lost their inverse correlation. And in fact, if interest rates rise, they're both positively or inversely correlated to rise in interest rates, positively correlated to one another for the first time. And so their conclusion was that the only inversely correlated asset class at this time of the cycle to the U.S. stock market, and I would argue to the U.S. dollar, would be gold and silver. So it should be central, I think, to everyone's portfolio. But again, and that's why I start out the conversation, John and Michael, by saying, look, this is about wealth. This is not about investment. Uh, it's about, it's about a, a hedge or a tether to your investments. And, uh, and, and I look at it, you know, I have three kids and I look at my gold and silver as something I hope I never need to uh, sell if I do. And it's not just for an emergency, the sky falling. You know, if we do see some sort of correction in assets, maybe it'll be buying blue chip stocks, trading at single digit price to earnings ratio, paying a 7% dividend like they used to way back when. Uh, it's for an opportunity as well. And if not, I'll give it to my children knowing that there are very few asset classes in the world that you can give to your children or your grandchildren or your nieces or your nephews or a church or a charity that you can feel confident down the road will retain some semblance of value as they have for 5,000 years. And I'm not trying you know, to be... Idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here again. I, I don't mean yeah. to cut you off, but there... What what I'm what I read a lot about, and and we're, we're kind of stressed as a country, and and I know we, everyone on this on this call knows that that over the last uh, maybe twenty years, the affluent marketplace has grown tremendously, but the bottom half of the marketplace kind of went backwards or stayed the same. And I, I I heard some stats recently. I think I think it was at the conference you attended also, Andy, that seventy percent of the population. Has, doesn't have enough money in their savings account to pay for an emergency. And that's that's a scary number, 70% of the population. So when you think about investments, gold, silver, stocks, bonds, they're kind of strapped. What, what do I do? How do I secure my future? How do I manage my wealth? And, and I think the concern they have is if I buy silver and gold as an asset that's, that's, that transfers wealth, I, I think they need it to live on. So I'm I'm not throwing a monkey wrench at you, but but how do people look at gold and silver as a way to grow my wealth? Uh, uh, slow maybe um, because I don't have enough to invest. I mean, what would your allocation be? I guess is my bottom line question. Well, I, I mean, thousand dollars. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Isn't that the eternal question? When you yeah. have interest <laughs> rates right now. Uh, on the 10-year treasury at 1.6%, but the CPI, which excludes food, energy, and housing, is at over 6%. Uh, fixed income ain't going to do it for you. The bond right. market ain't going to exactly. do it for you. Uh, so you're going to speculate into equities at the highest valuation ever with exactly. the lowest interest rates ever. So I would say to you, buying gold and silver is not uh, for wealth creation. It may make you wealthy if you own enough silver. It might. But it's, that's not what it's about. It's about wealth preservation. And you're right. Correct. What you said to me is the biggest issue facing our country right now, because the people who have assets do not care that gasoline and food and rent have gone much higher because their assets have doubled, tripled and quadrupled. But the people who have no assets, just liabilities, are struggling to make ends meet. And with inflation, not transitory, but structural and getting worse, it will only get worse. Uh, so I would say to the person who own, who has a thousand dollars to spend, it is not about trying to get wealthy. It's about trying to preserve what you have and buy when you can. And I, I'll answer it this way. Uh, and I, I think I might've even mentioned this at the conference. When I started in this industry, I was 19 years old and, um, my father and I started the company together with one rule upon one rule and only one rule or he would fire me. And that is that I buy something every two weeks. He didn't care if it was one ounce of silver. I buy something with every paycheck or he fires me. Now that was 31 years ago. 
I, I own the company. Right. I'm the president. He's not going to fire me anymore. But what it's taught me was savings and cost averaging and paying myself first any way that I can. And um, so I guess I would simply say to you, for the people out there who are struggling to make ends meet, uh, unfortunately, probably don't have the luxury of buying something that doesn't pay a coupon. But at the same time, what can you buy any longer that doesn't come with an inordinate amount of risk that pays any return? And when we talk about a 10-year treasury that is actually real negative by about 4%, you know, this is a problem for a lot of people. I get it still doesn't diminish the fact that 50% of every dollar ever created in the history of this country was done in the last 20 months, that they just passed a semblance of the infrastructure bill of a trillion and a half dollars a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. The numbers are so big and so astronomical and what's happening to the value of the dollar is exponentially increasing. So I think you buy gold and silver as often as you can you don't look at it as an investment. You look at it as wealth that you hope you never need to use. If you do, you're darn glad you have it. And if not, you give it to your children. And in a world that's struggling for price discovery, uh, to find what real price discovery is. You see, John, where I think this country has kind of fallen off the rails is in interest rates. Where yeah. I come from, interest rates are supposed to be predicated by the market, not by the central planners. And it's created price distortions. And so if you have assets, You've done well. If you don't, you're struggling and probably will continue to struggle when you look at who the Fed is. I mean, look at what just happened last week. The, the Fed announces tapering uh, and the bond market rallies by 10 percent in four days. How the hell does that happen? Why? Because because the bond traders who are the most sophisticated traders on the planet realize that Powell is out and they're going to bring in Lael Brainerd, who is a modern monetary theorist, sweetheart of the of the progressive left. Same thing with the, the comptroller, o Omarova. She wants to, to get rid of all the commercial banks and give all money, uh, all monetary uh, um, responsibility to the Federal Reserve, a digital currency. They will not taper. And that's why the bond market rallied instead of fell when they announced tapering. Powell's on his way out. Brainerd will come in and she'll issue in more of the same money creation, low interest rates. And so the people with assets will continue to make money and the people who don't have assets will find the cost of living exponentially increase. And yeah, this hope, is a problem. Hope we find a way to hope we find a way to to, to move out of that. I, I I'm I'm not happy I'm not happy to seeing what's what's being presented to the public. It, it's it's hard to figure it all out as an it's average scary. investor. Uh, so I agree. so let's let let's go with someone who has investable assets for a moment. Let's say you have sure. you have fifty thousand dollars to invest. You know, in your four hundred one k plan, you know, in, a, in an investment account, or how would you allocate metals or gold and silver to that portfolio? What percentages would you would you utilize, and what what would that be? Okay, well, and one of the things that I've talked with you guys about now, both at, at our at your show and on your podcast, is the action of the Bank of International Settlements in April of two thousand and nineteen. I just want to mention that for one moment. That to me is the biggest event of my career, where you had the central bank or central bank say to the world that gold will be the only other tier one reserve asset on the planet next to US dollars. And this to me crystallizes in my mind why you've seen such rampant acquisition while holding down the price by the central banks. They wanna reposition and de-dollarize. In fact, Russia just came out yesterday or the day before and said that they have more gold in their reserves and they do dollars for the first time ever. So my point is ultimately you want to be in gold because they, they've, they've shown you the playbook. It's a tier one reserve asset, the only other one in the world next to US dollars and treasuries. So this is where you ultimately want to be. But when you see a 75 to one relationship between gold and silver, which is rarefied air, it's only 10 or 20, 10, 15, 20% of all of human history has it been this high or less probably less, by 10% or less. The idea is to buy silver now at a relationship of 75 to one, as much as you can afford, with the intention, if the playbook goes to form, of converting it to gold, when it call, even if it fell to its 150 year average of 42 to one, it would almost be a double. Let's say it goes closer to what it's coming out of the ground at. 
could be as much as 10 times the return. And so my advice to people who have less in the way of capital would be look at silver as the opportunity of a generation because it's undervalued, it's, it's massively needed, it's depleted. Uh, the biggest money in the world is accumulating it. You buy it and, and, and cross your fingers and hope it appreciates. But even, even for people who have a lot of money and they're looking for ways to protect it, I think silver is the opportunity, in my opinion, for where I come from, of a generation. It doesn't mean you don't want to continue to own it even after you convert some to gold. All I'm simply saying is that the biggest money in the world is telling you that gold will be central to what's coming next. And I really do believe it will be pegged to a world reserve currency, a new one, even a digital world reserve currency to give it credibility. And in order to do that, it would have to reach levels that most people would think are crazy. Uh, and so I think you buy silver now with the intention and hope of converting it into gold when the ratio falls closer to its geological footprint or even its 150 year average. In terms of percentages, you know, that, that's, that's a, a personal question, I guess. Risk tolerance, where you are in age, what your intentions are, what you're trying to do. But the one thing that, that I really love about about silver is that all of the demand and all of the supply arguments that really make it an amazing choice, and it's still half of what it was priced at in 1980. And, and if it weren't for the fact that you have four commercial banks holding the most, the largest concentrated position on any commodity on the COMEX that it's ever seen in silver, the price would be much higher. And, uh, and I think you will see I think you will see uh, silver uh, many, many times what it is right now before it's all said and done. So for me, people looking for return, it'll be found in silver. People looking for stability, it is found in gold. And ultimately, gold is where you want to be. Silver just gives you a pathway into getting into gold that you can't find anywhere else. Right. Andy, listen, this, this, is, this has been great. So I, I'll just kind of, bottom line to me would be anybody who's listening should go to their financial advisor or or do their do their own research, uh, listen to maybe a couple of your podcasts and determine how much of their portfolio should be in metals. And again, to your point, is a good one. Age, you, you know how, how much time you have to invest, what's your risk profile, and you should look at all that. But a definite decision should be made from your standpoint to take a position in silver. And also with gold, but silver being a primary part of that from a timing standpoint. I get we don't talk timing a lot, but I think you're correct. The the the, the gold, the silver is really a, an opportunity of, of a generation. For your words, that could be very dynamic for someone who's looking to create some a little bit more wealth. So, so with that said, Andy, listen, I, I want to thank you for your time. I mean, you've, you've done two great podcasts with us. You became a dear friend of ours and an outsource specialist. And I want to thank you personally again to take your time out of your busy day to work with us on our podcast. And uh, Michael, you want to make a statement to Andy? Yeah, Andy, I mean, that, like last time, there's a lot of, a lot of great information there. And, and yeah, to echo what you said, that thank you so much for being a part of the podcast. And uh, I, you know, I think we could probably even do another one <laughs> based, on, based on all the information you gave. But we might, uh, so we'll, we'll probably delay that a little bit, but we'll probably have you back on sooner rather than later because I think um, you know, it's just good content and not, not content that many of our listeners hear uh, a lot. And I think that that's uh, important. So again, thank you so much for your time and um, we'll talk to you soon. Well, the honor is mine, you guys, and I wish I could really convey just how honored I am to be to be asked to be uh, take a small part in, in what you you gentlemen are doing. And I really uh, had a great appreciation and understanding for what you were doing at your show in Arizona, um, and, and it, it really is a distinct honor. Uh, any of anyone listening to this show, all they need to do is mention Copper Beach. Uh, on an email sent to Andy at Miles Franklin, I will reply back with my personal attention and guarantee the best price in the United States uh, for any of your listeners and uh, and clients. And yeah, I'm a phone call away. Anytime you would uh, like to have me, I'm certainly certainly very very happy to uh, to come back. And um, I wish you both a, a, a very happy Thanksgiving. And uh, hope you, you, too, you both stay well and look forward to picking up where we left off, hopefully not too far down the road.
Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, I'll tell you what, this, if there is a a definition of uh, standing on the shoulders of giants, I don't know what it is. That's how I feel right now. I'm just, I'm just listening to the three of you discuss this and talk about this and know how much I don't know (laughs) and how much I have to learn. So again, thank you all so much for the time and the energy and the effort and the education you put into every one of these podcasts. And of course, Andy, thank you for joining us on the show again. And the last thank you always goes to your listening audience. We wouldn't be here without you. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast with John and Michael Paris. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when John and Michael come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it really easy to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thanks so much for listening today. For everyone at Copper Beach Financial Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Please consult your own tax, legal, or accounting professional before making any decisions. Copper Beach is not affiliated with American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc., a member of FINRA SIPC, Investment Advisory and Financial Planning Services offered through American Portfolio Advisors, Inc., an SCC Registered Investment Advisor. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all types of investors. Copper Beach is an unaffiliated entity of American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Any opinion expressed in this forum is not the opinions of American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc., and American Portfolio Advisors, Inc., and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy.